Well, uh, yeah, very good evening uh, to you all. Uh, before we do have uh, uh, our scripture reading, I just want to say a few words. We are concluding Mark's gospel this evening, got to chapter 16, and just wanted to make a few comments about the end of Mark before we uh, have it read to us, because the ending of Mark is a bit unique um, for his gospel in the history of the uh, New Testament's transition, really, transmission across the uh, ancient world. And the reason is this, there have been two endings that have really circulated. One is a short ending of Mark, goes from chapter 16, uh, verse 1 to verse 8, and there is an, a longer ending, which goes from verse 1 to verse 20. And so, obviously, it cannot be true that Mark intended for both endings. He either wanted one, not the other, and so we have what we might call uh, textual critics who examine the thousands of bits of parchments and manuscripts that we have in order to work out what was the original text of any passage, but particularly of uh, Mark chapter 16 in question. Uh, it's a complex process. Uh, I'm not going to try to uh, walk you through that this evening. And if you were to read up about it, you would find there are good arguments for the short ending. There are good arguments for the long ending, too. Um, the longer ending we have in most manuscripts, so it's got a good amount of number to it. But the shorter ending uh, is available in the oldest surviving manuscripts. That's a kind of lay of the land. So what do I want to do this evening? I've got to make uh, one choice over the other. Well, I'm inclined to regard the shorter ending um, as the genuine of the two, and I want to give you two reasons why. Two reasons why I think it is. The first reason, as I've just said, is that our oldest surviving manuscripts available have the shorter ending but they don't have the longer ending. I'll tell you that point again. Uh, our oldest surviving manuscripts available have the shorter ending, but they don't have the longer ending. It doesn't settle the argument completely, I'll say that. I'm not complaining, it does. But I think it's one reason that inclines me to think the shorter ending is genuine. Just as a kind of side note, if you wanted to go and see one of the oldest manuscripts available for our Greek New Testament, which is exciting, it's in the British Library. Didn't know if you knew that. The museums are opening up. I think they've already opened up this week, so, you know, just throwing out there. Maybe you want to go and trot down and have a look. It's quite exciting. Um, anyway, that's one reason. My second reason is really the passage itself. It's got nothing to do with the manuscripts or the parchments or all of that stuff. My second reason has to do with the sudden shift in style because verse 9 to 20 do not sound like the same writer as that of chapter 1 all the way up to the chapter 16. And uh, there are certain Greek words, Greek phrases that are used in the longer ending of Mark chapter 16 that aren't used at all in the rest of his gospel. Uh, for example, I think verse 18 is quite strange. We've got this description of picking up of snakes, drinking poisonous substances that will not harm the drinker, then the promise of healing um, after those uh, that have got sick. I think that, they, they, that seems a strange verse to me um, compared to other verses in the rest of the New Testament. Um, there are two reasons why I prefer the shorter reason. I don't think they are the end of the story, um, and I may be wrong, but as of this minute, I want to tell you why I'm inclined to go for the shorter ending, and that's what I will preach this evening. Uh, you'll find great write writers, great Christian thinkers that disagree with me. Some of our English Bibles even agree with the longer ending, and so we have to allow for a measure of 
disagreement. But at the same time, it, it's good. Like when you open your Bible, when I open mine, uh, they are transparent, aren't they? They're transparent to show us the, you know, the, the, the kind of processes of getting to the original reading as much as possible. But while there might be disagreements in those things, there is absolutely no disagreement as to the original meaning. And that's what we want to take confidence in and encouragement in uh, this evening. Hope that's helpful to you. I thought it would be good to at least describe that and explain that before we read the text together, because I will just be going up to verse 8. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks, Gav. Well, let's open our Bibles, Mark chapter 15, verse 42, through to verse 8 of chapter 16. Um, we'll uh, read this, then uh, we'll have another song played, all praise to him, and then Gavin will come and open God's word to us. Mark 15, verse 42. It was preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath. So, as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in the tomb cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus and Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Well, let us pray together and ask for the God, our God's help. Heavenly Father, we now ask you that you would both honour your word, but also you would honour the work of Christ in our hearts and lives, we uh, require feeding from the truth. And that means we require power from you, our God on high, if we are to both listen and to understand. And so hear us now, we pray, we ask that we would uh, see our risen Lord Jesus Christ once more in his glory, attracting us to himself. We do pray this in his name. Amen. Uh, well, perhaps I can just read uh, the end of Mark chapter 15 from verse 42 as our introduction for this evening. We're reminded after the crucifixion of Jesus that it was preparation day, verse 42, that is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. 
So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took the body down, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was uh, laid. We have had it confirmed twice, if you noticed, in those verses that Jesus has died. Um, uh, and Pilate is so surprised at the news of his death. It's obviously been a, quite a quick crucifixion in, in our measurement of time. He's so surprised by it that he wants to make sure that Jesus has in fact died. And that's there in verse 44. It's told twice, isn't it, to the reader, Jesus has died. And then there is the speed of Jesus' burial. Um, Joseph of Arimathea wastes no time. They need to get him buried before the sundown. Why? Well, the Sabbath is just around the corner and you don't do any work on the Sabbath. And so there is a, there is a speed by which Jesus is placed in the tomb. And of course, we we finish chapter 15 with these two women seeing uh, the tomb, seeing the garden of this man, Joseph, where he lays uh, the Lord Jesus. And that takes us into chapter 16. And chapter 16, verses 1 to 8, all revolve around the tomb itself. And I've got three points, really, to kind of take us through that. So verses 1 to 4, we approach the tomb. In verses, the following verses, we go inside the tomb. And verse 8 concludes with the women fleeing from the tomb. And they're really my three points to dwell upon these verses. So let us approach the, let us approach the tomb with the women in chapter 16, verse 1 to four. When the Sabbath was over, we read, the same two women, Mary, well, well, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, well, who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, has been rolled away. We begin after the Sabbath, a couple nights later, um, from the end of chapter 15. And from the buying of the spices to their worry about how they're going to move the stone away from the entrance to the tomb, we are given insight, aren't we, into uh, these women's lives and into their hearts. We're given insight into their hearts because um, uh, we're given a sense of the expectation that has uh, fallen upon their minds. What do they expect? Well, they do not expect anything other than uh, their Lord to still be in the tomb. And we know, of course, don't we, that um, when they finally look up and see the fact that the, 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 the stone is over the entrance to the tomb, they're bemused, aren't they? They're bemused as to how and why this stone has already been moved from its place. You see that expectation has been thwarted in their hearts, don't we? Now we know why the stone has been rolled away. We know it is because our Lord Jesus has been risen, raised from the dead... And we know that really for two reasons. Many of us, firstly, already know the end of the story. But the second reason is that Jesus has been promising 
all along from the very beginning that he's going to rise bodily from the grave. And so our expectations in verse 3 are not thwarted in the same way as that of the women. And so go over the detail of verses 1 to 4. Every little detail reinforces to us the way in which these followers of the Lord Jesus are still wrestling, aren't they? They're still wrestling with the very fundamental nature of Jesus' own identity. These women's spiritual understanding of Christ is still at a bit of a crossroads. Um, And so it's coated in irony. Their approach to the tomb is coated in irony. Think about the detail here, brothers and sisters. It takes place right after the Sabbath in verse 1. The Sabbath has already been an important part of these verses from verse 42. Think about the Sabbath for a minute. The Sabbath. The Sabbath is meant for rest, isn't it? To give you and me spiritual rest, rest in the saving character of God who loves his people. That's that's the point of the Sabbath, isn't it? Well, the glory of Jesus' resurrection is this, isn't it? It announces the dawning of a new spiritual rest in Christ. Because Jesus proves that sin has finally been defeated by his rising again. And so on the resurrection morning, the approach to the tomb is the dawn of a perfect Sabbath fulfilled rest. It's wonderful news. And it's just as Jesus promised he would do. But isn't this so ironic? Isn't it ironic? Because of how busy the women are. Do you see how busy? and weary their hearts are, they're not at rest. The resurrection morning, their approach to the tomb, they're getting up at the crack of dawn, the sun has barely risen, they're buying their spices, they're getting them ready, aren't they? They're taking a walk in pitch black, ancient world darkness to get to the tomb. Resurrection, Sabbath rest from sin. That's what's made available. But you can see how busy these women are. You see how they're still struggling with who Christ is. They could have had a lion. I'm going to have a lion tomorrow morning. It's going to be fantastic. No, their hearts are busy, aren't they? They're weary because they're still working out who their Lord is. And then consider this detail about the spices. They buy these spices to anoint the body of their Lord Jesus in their approach to the tomb. But that's ironic, isn't it? He's already been anointed. He's been anointed by God the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit through through the Spirit's power in raising him from the dead. You can't get a greater anointing than that, can you, brothers and sisters? And furthermore... It's not that just Jesus has been anointed by his resurrection. It means we are the anointed ones, aren't we? Anointed with the forgiveness of sin. Anointed with the guarantee the kingdom of God has come. If Joseph of Arimathea was waiting for it. We're anointed with eternal life. That's all bound up with the fact that our Lord, the Lord of these women, has Uh, been raised from the dead and yet that they're going out of the way they're spending their money and their hard-earned cash on no doubt expensive perfumes to anoint a savior they will not find but that's that's their approach to the tomb it reveals these women still trying to get into their hearts as followers of christ just who he is what his identity is And so much so, they're asking each other, well, how are we going to get into this tomb? They're in darkness physically because the sun has not risen, but their hearts are still troubled in spiritual darkness. The darkness of sorrow, yes, but also the darkness of of hearts that are still trying to wrap their minds around Christ. 
That's what we see as they approach the tomb in verses 1 to 4. But let us go inside the tomb, secondly. Let us go inside there from verses 5 to 7. Just look at verse 5. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Of course they are alarmed. The young man in question is an angelic messenger, and I really love that little detail that he's just sitting there, sitting there waiting for them to come because he knows and is expecting their arrival. He's waiting for these women to relay to them good news. Yes, they're afraid at the sight. They're afraid in a similar way to those shepherds at Jesus' birth at the sight of the angelic realm coming from the heavens, announcing his birth. So the birth of Christ, so the resurrection of Christ is announced to the world by an angelic voice. Now what do we learn, brothers and sisters, from what the angel has to say to these women inside the tomb this evening? Firstly, we hear him say to them, well, don't be afraid, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen he is not here first thing that we learn about um, the last first lesson we have inside the tomb here we never go into the tomb of christ yeah we never go into the tomb of the lord jesus if we think we are going to find him there it's what the angel tells these women you won't find him there you'll never find him there read the Gospel of Mark 400 times, it will be the same every time. He won't be there. Do the same for Matthew, do the same for Luke, do it for John too. He won't be there. Of course we expect him to be there. That's a surprise. We expect him to be there. It's interesting what the angel says. She does not simply say that Jesus, of the, Nazare Jesus the Nazarene died, does she? Does he? He says, no, this is the Jesus who was crucified. This is the Jesus that underwent both physically and spiritually that horror of his crucifixion that we were thinking about with Chris over the last couple of Sundays. That's what he just went through. You don't come through an ordeal like that, still breathing. Pilate's guaranteed it earlier on in uh, this passage. This is the Lord Jesus. He's known the full fury of Rome. He's known the full fury of the crowds and their mockery, crying out, for his death, and then their mockery of him on the cross. And on top of that, most and worst of all, he's known the full wrath of his God, his Father, taking sin's consequences upon himself. All of that is bound up in the Jesus of Nazarene who was crucified. You don't come through that ordeal breathing, my friends. You get to the tomb, you approach the tomb, of course, given that he's just been through that. He's going to be inside the tomb. The angel says differently, he is not here. Of course, it's the place you go looking for him. The women, they've witnessed this very same crucifixion before their own eyes. But he's not found there. And why is he not found? The angel just gives the three simple words, he's risen. He's risen. Can this angel offer any support for such a ridiculous claim? Can he offer any support to make that kind of claim? Well, he does, yes. Really, he offers you and me two evidences for such a claim. Here's the first one, brothers and sisters. He simply says to, the, to these women, see the place where they laid him. That's in verse 6. See the place where they laid him. Here's the first proof. Our Lord has risen. The place that Joseph put the man's body just a couple of nights before is empty. Now that, my, brother, my friends, is enough. That's enough to believe, isn't it? The tomb is empty. There's no body to be found there. 
As far as this angel is concerned, that is enough for you, for me, to be convinced. Our Lord and our King has risen. We have another piece of evidence. But go, read on in verse 6, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. We don't just have an empty tomb this evening. We also have the words of Jesus himself. That's what the angel says. You will see him in Galilee, just as he told you. Where did he say that? Now whirling back in this whole year-long series of Mark chapter 14, he did say that somewhere, didn't he? Yes, he did. The angel's right. It's in Mark chapter 14. It's in Mark chapter 14, verse 28. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. The promise of resurrection right there. The promise that his disciples, his followers will see him in Galilee. Now this, my friends, is even more compelling evidence for our Lord Jesus' resurrection. It's more, it's more compelling than the empty tomb. The words of the Lord Jesus himself, his own promises are under scrutiny here, aren't they? If Jesus doesn't fill that promise in Mark 14, verse 28, if he only says he will return to life, yet fail to deliver, well, then his integrity is thrown into doubt. He's a liar, or he makes false promises at best. This is God incarnate before us this evening. The fullness of God's truthfulness, the fullness of God's integrity, is clothed with shimmering beauty in the person of Christ. No one ever accuses Jesus of being a liar. Not even really our unbelieving world. Maybe one or two do, but not normally. He's not considered, considered as a deceiving so-and-so, is he? No, his word is considered to be truthful and honest. He told these women... He promised these disciples they would see him again. Go to Galilee. If there is one compelling reason to dismiss what natural reasons we have to discount a risen Christ, let us start with the man's integrity. Let us start with who he says he is, his truthfulness, his character, his reputation. God does not lie. Jesus, the Son of God, does not lie. Do you consider that the Lord Jesus really died, rose again to forgive you of your sin? Is that how you regard him? Do you think his word is true? Because if you don't, the alternative is he is a liar. He cannot be trusted. If you say we need more evidence or else I will not believe, well, I say to you the most compelling evidence is his integrity. It's his honesty. It's the man himself. You know, the word of God is promised in Christ, held by all four gospel accounts, makes you and me certain. We have a responsibility to come to him. Owning up to sin, confessing it. You're either his friend and he's your saviour, or he's your enemy and therefore your judge. Which one do you want? Go inside the tomb this evening with these women. Go inside with them. Because whenever we enter the tomb of Christ, it is not to find him. Instead, it is to celebrate its emptiness on one hand and to celebrate his faithfulness to his promises and his word on the other. Look at the place where they laid him. That is what these women see. No, we go in to rejoice in our Lord who upholds his promises. We do not go inside the tomb to grieve the sting of death, to be overcome by death's darkness. No, we go into the tomb to live. Live as no human being has ever been able to live before. Truly live. And thank God 
that it is only in this tomb, as we go inside it, we can be certain that not only has Jesus destroyed death for himself, risen to life, he guarantees he'll destroy it for those that love him. That's what we learn inside the tomb. One more point. Because we don't just have the approach to the tomb. We don't just have the scene inside the tomb. We also have the women fleeing from the tomb. In verse 8, trembling and bewildered, we read, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now we know from the other three gospel accounts that these women would report their discovery uh, to the disciples of our Lord. Well, the Gospels accounts fill out those details for us, and yet Mark has opted for a more unexpected conclusion. Don't you agree? How should we respond to the news of the resurrection? How do you respond to it tonight, whether you've heard it for the first time or for the 350th time. It is right, isn't it, that there is awe and gladness and joy and celebration that uh, sins have been forgiven and our own resurrection is now possible. That is a right response to our risen Saviour's news. And yet no more important is it to remember how world-shattering earth-shattering the news is. There should also be a sense of trembling, a sense of reverence. Think about these women as they leave the tomb. They are absolutely terrified, aren't they? Trembling and bewildered. They are shaken to the very core of their being. Why so afraid? Fear isn't the normal, perhaps, emotion we associate with the resurrection, is it? Why would they be afraid? Well, with the knowledge of God's power, as announced by an angel in bright, shining, white robes ought to come with it a sense of the utter power and majesty of our God in question. Think about the disciples early on in Mark. Think about how they trembled at the power of their Lord when he simply would steal an awful, ferocious storm. Yes, I'm sure they were happy that their lives were saved and safe, but we read that they were afraid. Think about some of the men and the women that witnessed this risen Lord Jesus drive out simply with a word of his mouth. Demonic forces, terrifying demonic forces. Those men and women were afraid. They were afraid at the demonstration of the power of Christ with the greatest demonstration of God's sheer majestic power is his son's resurrection. That is why they are afraid as they flee from the tomb. Surely we all ought to leave the tomb in fearful wonder, fearful wonder with hearts that are prostrated before God and before his power because Mark concludes leaving us with the thought of women shaking and trembling with holy fear. The full dawning of Christ's deity is now beginning to take shape in their hearts for that is the profound effect of his rising again. It is, as Paul would say in Romans chapter 1, verse 3, the resurrection after all that declares, appoints Christ to be the Son in great power. 
tremble in reverent fear at that kind of power. How do you leave the tomb this evening? How do we leave it together? Perhaps we need to remember afresh this, that actually to be confronted with a crucified saviour, a new risen saviour, should shake us to the core. Has our Lord Jesus become a bit too comfortable? Is he even too safe? Not that this is to be afraid of Jesus, of our God. No, this is to take a step back and realise just what power there lies in the heart of our God. That should shatter us, shouldn't it? I liked what Stuart said this morning, speaking in 1 Samuel, uh, describing the kind of fear of God that doesn't push us away from him. No, it's the kind of fear uh, that draws us to him. Draws us to him, so thankful that he has forgiven us of our sin, but also a little bit, wow, see the power of our God. How do we leave the tomb? What are the things that really make us afraid in this world? You know, if we are more afraid of a pandemic than we are of our earth-shattering risen saviour, then we have to repent and confess of that unbelief. If we are more afraid of this world if we are more afraid of other human beings than the risen Christ, we must allow him to address that in us, as in me. If we get more afraid of the ifs of this world, here's a challenge for me. I always think about, well, what if this happens? What if this situation turns out like this? What if this loved one, uh, uh, ha if, what if this happens to this loved one? And those what ifs, Make me afraid. And the thing with fear is it paralyzes you and it paralyzes me and it paralyzes us to seeing the deep power of God as our Savior has been resurrected from the grave in the power of the Spirit. And if we are more afraid of anything in this world than of him, of an uncertain future or whatever it might be, then we want to leave the tomb this evening praying, praying again, asking God for the resurrected power of Christ to break in to our hearts, to break in that we might see him once more for who he truly is, that we may behold him in his absolutely amazing and fearful majesty. We want to leave the tomb similar to the way the women do. We also struggle with who Jesus is. We still work our hearts into understanding his identity. And the great joy of the gospel, the great joy of this Lord Jesus, the great joy of seeing what happens to these women, is that that is what happens. They see Christ, they are shown him and the full dawning of his glory is revealed to them. That's a great thing for us to pray for our hearts this evening, isn't it? We've heard it so many times. The cross, the resurrection. Let us pray once more. Plead with our God on high that his risen saviour would break into our hearts. That we might love him, live lives pleasing to him and rejoice in him in our hearts. Let me pray. We'll have our final song together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that your word is trustworthy. The promises of Christ are true for us. We thank you that the news of his resurrection guarantees sins forgiven, guarantees the kingdom of you, our God, has come and is guaranteed to us. 
But we pray, Heavenly Father, pray in our own hearts that we would restlessly pursue a Saviour and his glory. We pray that we would appropriately revere him as we also love him. Thank you that you are not a God to run away from, but you are a God that draws us to you. Draws us to you as you show us the um, absolutely amazing power that is in your heart to raise your son from the dead and therefore to raise us from the dead. We pray we would tremble at your majesty and the majesty of our saviour, for he has risen. Heavenly Father, pray these things in our Lord Jesus' amazing name. Amen.